Deji. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but in my screen it says when the meeting starts, we'll let people know you're waiting. Oh. I can see it shows that you're in the meeting, Catherine. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I'll... Although we cannot see you, it's just uh, your regular profile picture. Good morning, good afternoon, and maybe good evening to some. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Um, let's see. Uh, we are waiting for um, Ola, or he is not attending today. Uh, he will not be attending today, um, but I think uh, we're waiting for Jahan, um, who will um, be moderating, co-moderating the session. Okay, very good. So maybe just like a two more minutes. Thank you. That's fine. Uh, in the meantime, can I ask you a question? Because your name is Tran T Nyok Beach. So uh, I hear you are called with your last name. So how do I pronounce that? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. You are. Uh... You read my correct my full name. Yeah, dragging okay. Yes. But uh, very difficult for you and others. So you can uh, call me by my nickname, Bika. Bika. Okay. Yeah, B -I -C -A. Thank you. Okay. I will do that if you do not mind. Um, and I will also call Deji with her shorter name, though I know that her full name is Ayo Deji Diolu Ajayi. So <laughs> we will get there. Um, but uh, uh, because uh, it will facilitate the communication if we can easily uh, pronounce the names. Let's wait for uh, Jahir to join. I think hi. is, uh, right. hi, hi, Catherine. <laughs> I, I join, you know, there are, yeah, hello. There are some, com you know, I don't know, problem in my computer. So I actually didn't see the link. So Melinda sent me the link and now I enter. So thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, so started. can you see, can you see us? Yeah, I can see you. I can, okay, open camera also. So I think now you can see me also. Okay. And uh, I see a black screen, but I see your full name is Murshid A. Jahan Konkar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. we call you. You can you tell Jahan. me Jahan. You can tell yeah. me Jahan. That is okay. easier. Okay, then uh, to make the list of long names complete, my name is Katharin Terwishga van Scheldinga, and everybody calls me Katharin. That is the easy part. So, um, Jahan, if you like yeah. to uh, kick off, uh, or do you want me to kick off? Let's let's see how I we go. I think you have already We're started. Going, you know, uh, just to give a brief introduction about me, I am Khandagar Moshedi Jahan. Everyone tell yeah. me Jahan. So I am the co-lead of MD Initiative and uh, lead of Work Package 2. So, um, you know, welcome everyone in this very important presentation, which is uh, organized um, uh, by Asian Mega Delta Initiative. And Again, again, university. So it's 
Catherine, you can start, but I know I, I, I was sick and uh, I, I didn't attend actually last uh, Delta talk, but uh, you know, when I was looking at uh, the, uh, the video, then I saw that in the last meeting, we actually struggled with time. So this time, uh, if the presenters, you know, uh, carefully, you know, uh, look at their, you know, time slot, like 20 minutes for the presentation, and then give us time for a discussion that will be very useful because we you know want to see what actually people because this is a very important issue to discuss so that's all from me Catherine you can okay you can thank you start. very much uh, Jahan and then uh, uh, please uh, Jahan uh, feel free that after 20 minutes or maybe by 15 minutes you give a very kind uh, reminder to the speakers because I know how it is when you are behind your screen and the slides you get yep. carried away because you want to explain properly right so that's very nice yep. uh, and yep. yes we very much like to do proper time management because people have other things uh, to do uh, just as an introduction in this collaboration of Asia Mega Deltas and Wageningen University and Research uh, the, we are focusing uh, on deltas and on different aspects in our research and we like to exchange with each other what we are working on, not with the idea that we know everything already, but with the idea that if we can share with each other, we can learn from each other and then we can kind of uh, co-create and have co-benefit from the exchange. So the topic of today is about the effects of saline line water irrigation on crops cultivated in Travin in Vietnam. And we have two important speakers on this matter. Um, and we will just go by as they are listed. Tranti Nyok Beach, we shortly call her Bika. She will, uh, she's from Travin University and she will present first. And after that, my colleague Ayo Deji Deolu Ajayi, she shortly is called Deji from Wageningen Plant Research. Uh, will present and then after that we have some time for questions and discussion if uh, as an uh, audience if you have questions for the speakers feel free to use the chat function uh, we want to make you uh, attention to the fact that we like to register this uh, webinar because also later on we make it available in the website so that others also can benefit from the discussion. Without further ado, um, I like to hand over uh, the microphone to Bika and uh, invite her to start her presentation. Bika, the floor is yours. Okay, um, there would be a bit of a switch. Um, it's a joint presentation between Bika and I. So I would start off and then there would be a switch in between and then I would come back to round off. So now okay, but, uh, just, just, a, just a second, Deji. For time yeah. management, the total presentation will not exceed the 40 minutes, right? Yes. So okay, we and do have, we need uh, to give it, you it, warnings yes. then for time? Yes, yes. We will uh, try our best to stick to it, but we also have uh, less than 20 slides, so we think uh, it would oh, work. Oh, okay. You yes. shouldn't worry so much. You're well organized, okay. ladies. Please, uh, go okay. ahead. So now I would uh, share my screen and then uh, start the presentation. OK, so as mentioned previously, the topic that we will be presenting today is the effect of saline water irrigation on crops in Travin, um, Vietnam. And um, I am Ayodeji Deji, um, like everyone calls me. I'm a plant physiologist from Wageningen University and Research. And my co-presenter today is Bika, who is from the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology in Traveling University, Vietnam. So the outline for our presentation is first with an introduction where we also talk about the impact of salinization, especially in the Vietnamese Mekong Delta. And then we will um, give an introduction into the sub project, which is really the topic of the discussion today on saline irrigation and then show the methodology and results from this um, sub-project, as well as give some conclusions, recommendation, and future um, research uh, questions in this case. So during this talk, um, you might notice that between Bikara and I, there might be a use of resilience or tolerance. 
just a heads up that we're actually referring to the same thing. In this case, uh, mainly talking about salt resilience or salt tolerance. So what started this whole process? So this is, of course, linked to the project Deltas Under Pressure. And this project has the goal where there is more of an interdisciplinary research team from work that also collaborates with other international institutes, in this case, and for this presentation, Traveling University, to kind of look at sustainable transition pathways for agriculture in deltas and think about what this kind of solutions would look like. And in this way, contribute to the sustainable developmental goal of zero hunger. So officially, the deltas on the pressure project ended in 2022, but this has been continued in a new phase, now termed um, Delta, Salinity and Drought. And this started this year and would continue until next year. So in terms of this project, there are two locations involved. The first is Bangladesh and the second is Vietnam. And today we will be focusing on one of the locations, which is Vietnam. So if we think about this, why Vietnam? And especially looking at the Vietnamese Mekong Delta. So the Vietnam, Vietnam is quite known or quite famous for being one of the main rice producers in the world. And the Vietnamese Mekong Delta is actually the major hub for rice production. But due to the effect of climate change and also anthropogenic activities such as management practices, this has led to an increase in saltwater intrusion, but also drought and flooding. So here, this is a map where you also see kind of um, you also see um, places in Vietnam, and what you nicely see is that these blue um, areas are really regions that are already experiencing saltwater intrusion. Famously, we have here Travin, which is the site of the experiments we'll be discussing today. But what you see also in this graph is basically projections that could happen by 2040. So if we sort of continue business as usual, there would actually be more saltwater intrusion inland in the Vietnam, in, into Vietnam. And of course, in severe cases, which could also happen due to also the extremities we are observing due to climate change, this could even go much further into um, in the map. So you kind of see this um, red line. So therefore, this is really a major cause of concern. But then, um, in 2016, there was also some assessment done to see what could be the effect. And so far, what they saw was that 11 of the 13 provinces in the Vietnamese Mekong Delta was actually affected by either saltwater intrusion, drought, or both of these two um, issues. And the major thing that happens is that this also has a very negative impact on crop cultivation as well as livestock rearing. So, for example, in that same year, there were losses on um, about 208,000 hectares of rice producing land, of which half of them saw a reduction in um, crop yield of about 70 percent. So this is quite devastating for people who experience um, this kind of situation. And on the other hand, looking at livestock, this also led to a lack of feed, as well as the availability of fresh water, leading to loss of cattle and poultry. So we know that this also has devastating repercussions for the um, production in that area. Therefore, we think it is really important to sort of mitigate the impact of these stresses and at the same time still look for a way that food production can still be promoted in these saline prone soils. So I will hand over to Bika now who would continue to talk about the sub project, which is this experiment done in Vietnam. Over to you, Bika. Uh, thank you very much, Daisy. And uh, to hey, uh, sustainable Delta developments adapting to climate change. The Vietnamese government has issued the resolution number 120E, replacement of rice production with uh, vegetable and fruits, especially uh, species with high salinity tolerance, uh, such as peanuts or melons. And uh, we also want to focus on the quality of crop rather than on the quantity. Uh, and we also want to apply irrigation techniques that can reduce using a fresh water resources, such as like automatic saving water irrigation system, circular water system of hydroponic, aquaponic. However, until now, uh, still lack of the research on setting the cultivation of the sun tolerance of growth and uh, variety. 
Therefore, we could like to evaluating the crop respond proper inside on the optimal salinity threshold as well as the potential yield of practic waters, uh, especially in case of the red water sustained during the bright uh, season. The uh, objective of uh, our study was uh, to assess the impact of the saline water irrigation on the crop growth and yield of the tree crop. Beetroot, maize, and peanuts uh, three uh, kind of uh, land were cultivated under the semi-controlled greenhouse uh, condition at Travon University, Vietnam. And uh, the semi-controlled greenhouse experiment with the storm concentration between zero to four ppt of nitric chloride with two experiments. The first one is the saline adaptation experiment. Uh, in this experiment, the uh, sun level of the water will be increasing over the time. And uh, the second experiment, we counted the uh, saline shock. So the tree will be watering directly at the water containing of sun at two, three, and four BBT at the reproductive state. So on the measurement factor of growing and development of tree, a high trend diameter, uh, diameter number of leaves at different state of growth from the nursery to harvesting will be measured uh, monitor every three days until the harvest. And uh, the data were analyzed by Dr. Daisy at Wagner University. Okay. Yeah. And uh, did he, um, our uh, features of the next half appearance. So the plan were a brand in a random completely lock design with five technical replicate for treatment for drug. So we had three with five replicate. Yeah. Next, please. Yeah. So uh, I think it is the time but, uh, to discuss about the, our results. So the first result saw the saline adaptation appearments were uh, prominent in order, but are fully observed for mate. In all case, we will see on the graph, there were a steep degree of the sun stress with significant difference among the defined sun concentration uh, already at the absurd time. And uh, we also saw that uh, the uh, high gate defined sound concentration of poor BBT for beetroot, Venus will be resigned in the easy value of 60, 6.5 and 70 at per meter. So it will be quite similar to the value of 10 for 3.5 BBT. Uh, on the other hand, we also see on the graph the high gate defined of sun concentration of May at 4 BBT only fixed at EC value of 3.75 uh, dF per meter. So this may be linked to the total number of days for sun application in May compared to the other crop. Uh, but even at the same time point of 66 day for stress, the EC value of beetroot and penis were still higher. So at effective, the soil pH remained relatively similar throughout the duration of the appearance, except for the beetroot land under the control condition that saw significantly lower pH at the later time points. So, and that, uh, the second uh, uh, result about the continuous erosion with water containing a uh, moderate level of salinity uh, we will recognize that have no negative impact on growth yields in one rolling season of the beetroot. So the, in the beetroot, we will see that the soil EC saw a strong uh, positive correlation with the total soluble solutes, but negative correlation with the diameter and uh, rest weight of the beetroot wound. Lee also another picture. Yeah. The higher the EC in the soil, affected the growth inside and toy of the breast bit. Uh, and we saw also we'll see that a significant reduction of the beetroot scales only occur under continuous saline erosion with easy value more than 420 uh, 27 uh, dF per meter. Although a significant degree in solutes uh, were unreal, already in DS1. The maximum salinity response of the beetroot is 3.5 ppt. Yeah. So uh, the next one, yeah. 
and uh, this is the continuous uh, erosion of the penis in the one growing season. So on the Yale parameter, except breast white of pork with tuners and percentage of rib pork has significant uh, negative correlation with soil C of the penis length. And uh, the penis yields uh, were not affected with the continuous erosion with uh, smaller than 4DF per, mit per meter of saline water. So the result uh, met the other research uh, that the maximum row rate of the pop volume uh, fork railway and six canal railway on the line and the fork and the canal volume at the harvest were reduced under sun stress salinity more than 2 bbt. And the next one we want to uh, concern about the uh, continent erosion uh, for May. So the soil EC will be negatively correlated with the cup length, number of the canal for row, and the number of canal in the makeup. For uh, May, continuous erosion using saline water with EC value of up to 3.75 monthly had no significant impact on crop yield. The exception E, where it recent with 3 DF per meter saline water resulted in a degree of number of canal and land of curve. Uh, the result, uh, result also agree with previous research that may had the ability to tolerate the salinity up to 2 ppt. And so for the part of the, uh, our conclusion recommendation and uh, for the future research, Dr. DZ will be coming back with you. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Bika, for the um, for presenting the results. So from what uh, Bika has been talking about, if we look re look back at the last graph where we saw the effect of um, saline water irrigation on soil salinity, we can see that the duration, which refers here to kind of the frequency of um, adding the saline water, but also how long you do it for, is just as important as the salt concentrations which you are using for the watering. So, for example, if we look at the 2 ppt continuous irrigation on pit root peanut and maize, at the end of the experiments, they did show different um, levels of soil salinity. So, for peanut or beetroot, root, it was more or less either 4 or 4.5 decimals per meter, which falls in sort of this moderate um, saline um, soil saline um, levels. But for maize, at the end of the experiment, this was this only reached uh, around 2.5 decimals per meter. And this is, has to do with the fact that for maize, the exposure to this saline water irrigation was only for 42 days compared to the other two, which was um, 84 days or 72 days. And then um, for the other box plots, what we saw is that there was indeed a significant reduction in peanuts in, and beetroot yield after you had um, continuous irrigation with two PPT of saline um, water or higher. Although, of course, for beetroot, we did see already a stimulation of um, soluble solids at um, even lower concentrations. But this suggests that at least if you're using um, levels lower than two PPT, so um, if you're doing continuous irrigation with um, around 1.5 PPT of saline water, that this does not have a significant impact on the peanut or beetroot yield. But of course, for maize, this was not the same. This was not the case because then we could not really see any significant differences. And this was already, which you saw in the box plus, was because there was a huge variation under all conditions. And this is, of course, linked to point one, that the duration was much shorter than it was for peanut or for beetroot. So this changes or these drops in yields, which we ex which was experienced at higher salt concentrations. This is something that is expected and is seen um, in the nice classification. We see that actually most crops would have the yields affected if you are if you have soil salinity levels that are greater than four decimals. So that was equals to the levels you would get when you had peanut or beetroot continuously irrigated with this two PPT um, saline water. But it's also probably an open question for us to also discuss further is that what would be sort of an acceptable yield loss for farmers? Because if we look at what happened at two PPT, which is approximately four decimals of soil sal salinity, what we did see was that for beetroot, there was only a drop 
in crop yield by 21% compared to peanuts, which saw half um, like a lot of uh, more drop in the yield, so about 50% um, reduction in yields. So this is something to also think about um, in this case. And then something to really note is that these results, of course, they sort of indicate that there is potential use for brackish water um, for continuous irrigation, but note that this is experiments from only one growing season. So what would happen if you continuously use this um, saline irrigation over time? Because what could happen is that you have this continuous salt um, salt accumulation in the soil. So meaning at the, for the next growing season, your salt in the soil might already be at high levels. But this could also be useful, for example, in closed systems such as closed uh, greenhouse uh, systems. And um, we try to see, is this um, already a technique used in Vietnam and other parts of the world? So um, Bika tried to do a really a nice literature search, but she found only few studies where they had um, used or experimented with saline water irrigation. And in this case, they had tested it on not just one cultivar, but on multiple cultivars of rice and peanuts in greenhouses. In Bangladesh as well, there were some studies which we found where they had also tested this on rice and maize cultivars and the results were quite similar to what we see here even though in this case they had tested this on uh, multiple cultivars rather than one cultivar which we have done in our case and in the netherlands this is something that is nicely used in fact there is also sort of an establishment of salinity thresholds for potato cultivars and this has been used to kind of indicate what potato cultivars would be sensitive or tolerant um, Yes, so these kind of studies are also uh, also definitely give um, some sort of outlook on on sensitivity or tolerance of crops. So this um, is sort of the take home message is that when we think about this in context, of course, um, this is use of saline or the potential use of saline um, water for irrigation and which is an adaptation technique. But to always think of this management strategies must first be critically assessed before implementation, because this will be vary from case to case and have both benefits and drawbacks, as we have mentioned in our case. So if we look at this, um, what we have focused on is saline irrigation, which we've kind of tried to assess what are the possibilities of these adaptation strategies? And but this is not the only strategy that exists. There are other strategies such as use of resilient cultivars, water retention and collection, water desalinization techniques, or use of amendments and biostimulants. And these techniques could actually be combined together to be assessed for their um, potential use on the field. And for us, in our case, we've tried to um, do this assessment by looking at greenhouse experiments or in some cases, or I would say by other um, researchers, there have also been some demonstrations to show the potential of using one or a combination of these techniques. But at the end of the day, you also want to think about the greenhouse experiments is just the start, but what would it take if we actually would like to think of this in terms of farmers' adoption, or if we try to think of this as one of a or of of a potential transition pathways for adoption? So next, we really think about what is the feasibility of scaling up these adaptation strategies, thinking of this in the terms of, of what could be the accessibility for farmers in that region. What are the current environmental conditions, what exactly do the farmers think about such um, strategies, but and also are their current policies supporting or against these strategies, and a lot of other things. And this is an aspect that would be a bit of the continuation of this research this year and also continued next year. So for this, we would really like to acknowledge our other collaborators in this project from Kanto University. So Dr. Nan, who I already saw in the audience, and also Tamantin. And for the audience, I say thank you for listening. And um, we're now open for questions and further discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deji and Bika, for your presentation. Um, I would like to ask to the audience if there are any questions. Can you raise your hands? Uh, 
I'm not seeing any hands yet. Mariana has I, I, a hand up. Yes, yeah. please, Mariana. Yeah, thank you, Pika and Deji, for this uh, presentation. So one, one, yeah, maybe easy question would be coming up. Yeah, once uh, you have uh, this uh, salt in the in the uh, in in the soil, what comes next? So it, it it's uh, it's it's higher and higher and higher. So what is the next crop that you can start with? Or yeah, what would be sort of um, a cycle, a farming cycle? That you can then do once you have started with using the brackish water and um, having higher salt levels in the soil. Thank you. OK, um, yeah, I can start and then Bika can jump in. I think you can look at it from various perspectives. So apart from, of course, this experiment was trying to look at the potential use, which could also be like, OK, this is too risky, this is too costly, but it also helps you sort of establish thresholds for this sort of crops in the Vietnamese context. Um, so one of the things to also look at, and, and that probably goes back to the last slide, was to, for example, think about using this in combination with various cultivars. Um, in that case of kind of establishing thresholds, you can also think of certain regions that are already naturally salinized in the Vietnamese Mekong Delta. So it can help you decide like, OK, we can see that May still survives at these um, levels of salinity. Therefore, we can grow this crop still there or we can grow this cultivar there. So kind of thinking of it from that angle rather than for example, um, really uh, doing that, um, really, really like um, adding more salts to the soil. You can, of course, also think of, um, for example, is it would it be then better to think of desalinizing the water? That's another technique um, in that case, or um, or even um, adding, let's say, biostimulants or amendments. But generally speaking. Indeed, once you have salt in the soil, it's very difficult to clean up. I think now it's just a phytoremediation and bioremediation that actually we've seen can take up um, those. So in this case, that would be either plants or bacteria or microbes that can take up salt from the soil. So those are the only, I would say, sort of effective ways. But that also takes a very long time. So as much as possible, um, Yes, we assess this and probably indeed that's more of the conclusion, but also the potential setting of these thresholds on what crops can withstand salt in the Vietnamese context. Mika? You're muted. You're still Ika. mute. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Mariana, for very nice question, and thank you very much for uh, Daisy for very detailed answer. So I totally agree with Daisy that uh, we just have like one drop of the seasonal in the, the greenhouse. So uh, it's very much uh, difficult right now uh, to uh, give the advice or recommendation to the local farmers. But uh, we, but unless we had the result that uh, we can give the water uh, with uh, lower than two ppt to, to water some, uh, some crop uh, for uh, and it will be not much affected to the yields, but uh, we need to do this in the real farm in um, like two season or three more season, and uh, maybe we need to combine with other techniques, and then we will have more experiments and uh, more advice to the local farmer how they can uh, do the well of uh, farming uh, with the sun intrusion. Uh, with their current rock, yeah, their current rock, we we use this because the, the local farmer is uh, very much difficult to change other species. So we use the current rock and the combination with other techniques to help them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Bika. Uh, Gerard, uh, I think you would like to add something, right? Yes, I also put it in the in the uh, in words, but um, doesn't it? the salt wash out if you use brackish water during the dry season. In the rainy season, doesn't the salt just wash out? So is this a real problem that you accumulate when you irrigate with brackish water? Or is it just for the dry season and in the wet season, in the rainy season, it will just wash out and then, you know, the, the soil is, is more or less remedi remediated. Would you like to react to that, Bika? Yeah. 
so uh, so uh, you asked us uh, about like our experiment, yeah. So and our experiment we work uh, we do this in the greenhouse, and uh, uh, because this is the the season uh, the raining time in Vietnam for our experiment, and uh, we uh, we do not uh, do this experiment before. So we want could like to testing. So we do not like we do the greenhouse like in the dry season outside, yeah. So we yeah. know that the 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 group can uh, tolerate uh, the uh, what uh, salinity level that the the the, the tree can tolerate and uh, development. Yes, but my and question is more related to the remark of Mariana, where she said that isn't there a problem of accumulation of salt in your soil, and what happens with the next crop that you grow on the soil that you have irrigated with the brackish water? And I was just wondering whether that really is a problem in the Mekong Delta, because in the rainy season, uh, the salt will wash out and there will be not a lot of salt left. So it's only a problem for the dry season. And that's where you grow your crop under these brackish conditions. I was just checking whether my assumption is true that it will only be accumulating during the dry season, but will be washed out in the in the rainy season. So, so then, in a way, to, to ask the question to Deji and Bika, that did you measure the salt level in the soil during the experiment? Because if that is what you're measuring, then once you bring the experiment to the field, it will also be important to see what is the salt level in the soil during the experiment and also during the season that comes after that. Because what Gerard says is that the build up because if you bring salt water to the plant the water will evaporate so you will accumulate salt if you wash out the salt during the rainy season then you do not have the accumulation of salt so that is what uh, we need to check right yeah so um there are two things i think that it really <laughs> depends Yes, there can be indeed some reduction or more like um, dilution of the salts in the soil, depending on the weather conditions. But we are also now, for example, seeing more intense or longer periods of drought sometimes in some seasons. But also we also get higher flooding in, in, in that case. In, so for some things, I would say that yes, indeed, there can be further dilution, but I still think in the long term, so if you look at this over years, you do not still have full dilution of the salt. So if you continuously irrigate over time, it couldn't probably in five years, it might not be a problem. But then in 10 years, then you have, let's say, more intense drought or you also have, for example, like with the salt water intrusion also increasing. So at the end of the day, you might still kind of be buying time in that case. But okay. if you also have... Be Sorry to interrupt Sorry. you. It will be good also to hear from the, the other people on the call. Uh, is there yeah. experience uh, in the longer term consequences and have people already measured uh, on that? Can can we just ask from the audience? Yeah, uh, you know, well, I asked this question, Katilini. Exactly. Yeah, uh, good. Uh, yeah because because uh, if you think about the scaling up the, of this kinds of technologies, uh, need the answer of this because you know uh, you are using salt water irrigation, meaning uh, you know accumulation. Uh, you know what the presenter said. That's a, that's a big issue uh, um, of uh, salt. So uh, you know. I do not know. Is there any study in Vietnam condition or Bangladesh condition or in other situation? What's the long term consequences of this saline water irrigation? At least I would okay, say sir. for myself, I haven't seen any sort of reports like that. And that's also like a research area that is just lacking, that no one looks at the long term consequences. It's more like, oh, this is a solution. and not what would happen in the next five or 10 years if you continuously use this. OK, so this is what we will be looking for. Uh, uh, what I do know from the Bangladesh situation is that uh, in the uh, rainy season, then there is so much water coming from the big rivers 
that even in the in the coast on the seaside, that if you taste the water, it does not taste salty. So what Gerard says about uh, dilution, dilution, it could very well be that the salt is removed. Uh, however, in that case also, uh, often the soils are clay where you have capillary rise. So if you are able to flush down uh, the salt, the matter will also be how much time it will take to get back up. But also there, there are ways like with mulching or with, and that's uh, how people are trying to limit it that. But altogether, I think we are clear that, uh, okay, Feroz, you wanted to say something before I concluded the topic? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, so I was uh, yeah uh, listening to you uh, and this amazing discussion that uh, we do get a lot of rainfall in the monsoon and the rivers might not be as salty as uh, during dry season. But like uh, the places in Bangladesh, we, we have a lot of boulders in the coastal region. So then those places might not be flooded at all. So the salt might still be on the soil if it's not like uh, flooded. If it's the rainfall, it's like overland flow so it doesn't really stay to remove the salt in my opinion so i think land use also plays a big role i i don't know about macon delta if they have a lot of folders as well so it will not be easily removed with the monsoon rain i would say if it's not flooded in my opinion i'm not an expert by the way okay so it will be important that we find more information from experts on this matter uh, i also would like to Ask to Rob Coutwell. He posted a link to a science article. Um, would you like to come in and say something more about yeah. that? Yeah, I would if there's time. My name's Rob Caldwell. I'm with Erie and I'm involved in the Asian Mega Delta Work Package One. I'm based in Hanoi. I shared that link. That's to an article uh, through some colleagues at the Australian Centre for International uh, Agricultural Research, ACR. Um, if I could just add a couple of things to the discussion. Yeah, it's very interesting and it's a very serious situation now with the salt water intrusion and the general's um, the levels of, of, um, of salinity in those areas. Essentially, the land is, is Thinking uh, 10 times faster than the sea is rising. So there's whole areas of the Mekong River Delta that are, that are no longer able to support crops. The general pattern is that in the past where farmers have grown three crops of rice a year, continuous rice cropping, they're now tending to go from three crops to two crops. So they grow another crop during the rice season, an alternate crop that's more salt um, tolerant. And the same going from two crops of rice to one crop. And then eventually when the salt water accumulates so much, they start to do rice shrimp. OK, so they grow shrimp during the um, dry season. And then in the end, that also breaks down. So all they can do is grow shrimp. I mean, it's essentially that. And the article I shared from, from um, ACR just gives a summary of the potential alternative crops similar to what you've done. Some of what you've tested is in in included in there. Uh, it's a very serious issue for us in the Asian Asian Mega Delta and something that we're very interested to collaborate with you about. We're mainly working with Kanto uh, University on it, but I would very much like to get in touch with uh, Bika and discuss with her and maybe when I come down to Econ River Delta next time maybe we could arrange to to meet up but i would really suggest if you just open that article it's really excellent link and it explains what i've tried to summarize much better than 
what I've done. But yeah, it's extremely serious. If you look at the, the map of agricultural production, say 10, 10 years ago, and then compare it to now, there's a huge increase in the areas where shrimp are grown, uh, just merely because nothing else can be grown there anymore because it's all too saline. OK, thank you very much, Rob, for bringing that up. And also very interesting to kind of link from the work package one of Asia Mega Deltas with this part uh, of the work in our research in Wageningen. It will be interesting for you to know that the team from Wageningen also will be visiting Bangladesh. They are talking also with Dr. Nan on finalizing the dates. Yeah, I understand it's not yet finalized, but it will be somewhere towards the end of November. So if uh, that would create possibility for exchange, if you possibly would be in the Delta at that same time, that would be an excellent opportunity to explore. Um, for that, you can uh, contact uh, also with Mariana uh, uh, or with any of the other team. Um, I also think that uh, we, we are kind of zooming in and zooming out all the time. Uh, and that's the, um, that makes this topic very exciting because this is a very kind of zoomed in part of the topic that if we would use the salt water, then what happens to the crop? And so your research uh, shows that exactly that's part of the story. And Rob, what you say in a way uh, refers to a bit kind of the wider picture also, what kind of strategies are currently observed and from what strategies uh, we already know that it, it, it does not work or it will not work. But so we are kind of looking for also for new strategies and the work of Deji and Bika in that sense and the, the, all the other colleagues helps to uh, uh, find some uh, paths that could be potentially interesting and some that we do not know. And, and the difficulty is, in a way, I feel that for the path that is interesting to use some salt water in a way up to uh, one and a half PPT, if I uh, understand you correctly, that could be uh, potentially a way. However, that's what we uh, discussed just now. We are interested in the salt accumulation in the soil and what that means over time, whether the seasonal rains will be able to flush it down, whether the capillary rise will not uh, bring it back with the same speed. So um, though we have uh, important new information on the way we like to go, uh, we have already identified more questions. Uh, and it stresses also how important it is that we work together with all these different um, uh, expertises. Uh, I would like to uh, see if there are other people who have questions. Um, but I did not see other hands. Uh, Jahan, what, would you like yeah. to come in from your side? Uh, yeah, but no. You already responded my question, but you know, uh, uh, in relation to Rob, uh, I think in Bangladesh case, you will find several articles related to these issues. You know, uh, what happened, you know, when some of the farmers, they are interested to farm shrimp in their land, meaning saline water intrusion, and what kind of social conflicts, uh, you know, that is creating with the uh, other, other, you know, uh, crop farmers, in that there are there are I think there are uh, uh, you know many good publications related to this issue because this is actually a serious concern you know of this research that you know you you need to uh, not only the production or income perspective but other social perspective you need to look at this uh, uh, so uh, but thanks for the presenter to bring in this kinds of important issue in the in the presentation and 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 it's. Uh, you know, we can actually look at, you know, uh, how, how in the future uh, we can uh, build up research on this issue. And that's a, that's a good attempt. Thanks from uh, the initiative side. Okay, very good. 
I, meanwhile, I'm having a look at the chat. Yeah, uh, Rob added something uh, there. Rob, would you like to, to say it? Yeah, yeah only that I think it's be important to in, include rice because it's such an important crop there. All farmers grow at least one crop of rice a year. And uh, we do have some ongoing screening of salt tolerant rice, um, rice varieties. So we can share the information about those with you if you're interested. That will be very nice. Thank you very much yeah. for that. Um, if there are no further questions at this stage to our speakers, would you like to add something as a final word? Or you are OK with what you have said? That's also fine. Um, in the um, <laughs> as part of the, yeah. the follow up of this Delta talks, we will again uh, organize another Delta talks, um, most probably uh, around Four. 25th Four. of September. Am I not wrong with the date? I think 25th, yeah. Uh, yeah, Melinda, are you are you are you there? I think it's 25th, uh, 25th September is the next Delta talk will be by okay, so the you will, you will, Yeah, so you all will be informed and invited and already for yeah. your agendas uh, already in the October months. Uh, we are also planning a Delta talks next time. Uh, I do not know yet, but uh, uh, from AMD side speaker will be identified and uh, for yes. the October month. Um, we are on the Wageningen side already identifying a speaker. Um, then uh, one more point uh, uh, of announcement that I like to make is that uh, in uh, October uh, in the uh, ICWFM conference in Bangladesh, there will be a session on salinity, uh, but that's a kind of face-to-face uh, -face, uh, session. But anybody interested who would like to attend that, let them send me a mail uh, and I'll link you up uh, with that. Um, so the, uh, having said that, uh, I'm getting the information that the next one, I said 25 mistakenly, I should have said 27 September. Thank you for correcting me on that, uh, Melinda. Um, I want to conclude nicely within the time. Um, thank you for to the, the two speakers for this very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you all, uh, all in the audience for your reactions. Um, thanks to my co-facilitator Jahan for jointly facilitating this session. We look forward continuing our Delta Talks next time on 27 September on the same time with another interesting topic. Thank you all and have a very good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.